Thanks for coming along this evening and thanks to everyone who is watching online. My name is Anand Menon, I'm director of UK in a Changing Europe. For those who don't know, UK in a Changing Europe exists to try and spread the word about the findings of research. Given that, we're very keen to debate those findings and to have discussions about what the research says. And it's with a view to doing that that we're here tonight. I think it is fair to say that the majority of professional economists take one view on the impact of Brexit. However, as we are all aware, there is a debate about this and we thought it was long past time to sit down and have that debate in person. So that's what we're here to do tonight. Uh, we're gonna have a couple of presentations to, start to kick us off. Then we have a debate within the panel. Please uh, submit your questions using Slido if you can, because it helps keep things moving. The aim is to have as good a debate as possible, uh, to get through as many of the issues as possible, and to do it efficiently and politely. Uh, throughout the course of the evening. Politely is quite important as well for those who want to stick their hands up and ask questions. But without further ado, I'll kick us off by handing over to Marion Khan, who's economics editor at The Times, and who has very, very kindly agreed to chair tonight's event. Marion. Thank you, Anand. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us and for everyone who's online. Uh, my name is Mehreen. I'm the economics editor at The Times, uh, a job that I've been doing for almost a year. Uh, and during that time, uh, you know, economics coverage in the UK has been dominated by stories around inflation, uh, now financial stability, and also uh, Liz Truss. So I'm quite glad that we have an opportunity to actually refocus a little bit on Brexit, which I think amid the sort of maelstrom of sort of mini crises and shocks the UK economy has been having, is perhaps got a little bit less attention in the last year or so, uh, as policymakers are, you know, battling different... Most mainstream newspapers, including mine, is going to be a few presentations where panelists, uh, then John will come up and do a little bit and we will all then go, we can keep it very accessible uh, and open for people to feel like they, it's a, this is a, a safe area for them to ask any questions. Uh, my job as a journalist is usually hopefully to ask the, the dumbest question in the room, so I'll be very happy to do that too. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone in the order they're going to come up to speak uh, and then tell, first of all tell you uh, who our five great panellists are. We're going to start with Graham Gudgeon, who's from the Centre of <coughs> Business Research based at the University of Cambridge. Graham is going to kick us off with his, uh, I don't want to use the word contrarian because I don't like that word, but his thoughts on what Brexit has done to the UK economy so far and probably breaking with a little bit of the consensus. Um, and then he would be followed up by Julian. I think that both of their presentations are going to build upon one another. Then we have John Springford, who is from the um, Centre for European Reform, Deputy Director of the Centre for European Reform, which celebrates its 25th anniversary this year, I was reminded, uh, who's going to come up and, and, and initially, I think, address some of the points that the first two speakers are going to make about some of John's work, which is sort of creating a sort of counterfactual uh, doppelganger model about what the UK would have looked like if we were still in the European Union. Then we'll sit over uh, onto the table and we have two initial respondents, Sophie Hale, principal economist at the Resolution Foundation who works on Brexit issues and trade issues is going to give her thoughts. And then finally we have Jonathan Fortes who is a fellow at UK Changing in Europe and also um, uh, does economics and public policy at King's College will give his initial thoughts and then we will uh, get into it. We have one hour and four Five minutes. Sometimes as a moderator, I, uh, I'm in a bit of trepidation when I, we have so much time, but I think uh, on this occasion we're going to have more than enough uh, to get our teeth into. And uh, to kick us off, I will hand over to Graham to give us his presentation. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much, uh, Marine, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. I, I'm most grateful to Anand and his, uh, his colleagues for this opportunity to examine the economic impact of Brexit. Uh, I think both Julian and I both recognise that there is a near consensus, uh, at least among what used to be called the chattering classes, uh, that the impact of Brexit has been both negative and substantial. But our contention is pretty well the opposite of that. Uh, and it is that this consensus is not based on any very sound evidence and is magnified by an unbalanced coverage in important parts of the media, uh, so some of which Mary used to work in, so I won't, uh, I, I won't name names. But in, the, in this presentation, we just want to focus on the, on the facts of the matter. Um, our full evidence is presented in the, uh, on a long report on the briefings for Britain website, uh, and in this report, and we've got a few copies here if anyone wants to take one away. <coughs> 
So let's start with GDP. What's, what's actually happened to GDP since the referendum and since we joined the single market in beginning of 2021? Uh, we can see there that the, uh, uh, over the longer term, the UK has followed the G7 reasonably closely, um, but coming out of the, uh, uh, of the recession um, uh, around COVID, uh, the UK recovery has been a bit slower than the, UK average, uh, than the G7 average by a couple of percent. But if we take the US out of the G7, then the UK is actually better. So it looks like the UK is, is pretty important in this. And the reason why uh, the, the US plays a big role is because there's been a, a really quite strong fiscal expansion in the, in the, in the US under both Trump uh, and recently under Biden. There's the evidence for it. I, I, uh, I, I won't dwell on that, but we can come back to it in questions if anybody wants to, uh, to talk about it. Here's the individual uh, members of the G7 looking at growth in GDP since uh, 2015 just, uh, and Canada. Uh, the period at the end of uh, 20, 2019, just to the, the, the left of the first vertical line, um, pick out a period there when the, the growth between then and the latest figures at the end of 2022 are just slightly negative for the UK. And the UK over that particular period was the slowest growing uh, of each of those uh, countries. But look, it's very slight. It really doesn't mean very much in, in, my, in my view. Um, and we'll have to see what happens from here on in. And one of the things about Brexit is I think it will take a while to, for us to really know uh, w whether the impact has been negative or positive. Uh, my own personal view, and I did quite a bit of modelling on this on, uh, in the days when the Treasury was um, uh, putting out report, was allowed to put out reports, and uh, my view always was that it would make very little difference uh, either way. And uh, that seems to be happening, but we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, Sorry, just one other thing to say about this is the, the, there's a measurement problem here. The way the ONS measures output in the public sector in, in, <coughs> in the UK is different from nearly all the other countries, and it exaggerates the, the downturn. For instance, on their measure, there was something like a 20% fall in the output of the NHS uh, during the pandemic. Uh, now, my daughter and son-in-law both work in the NHS, and it was news to them that it was really falling. <laughs> in output since they were working their socks off. Um, other countries do it a, a different way. And it's probably the case that the UK's fall in, uh, in, in GDP in the middle of the pandemic was probably about half of, of what's normally shown in the figures. Uh, and that affects the recovery as well. So we can look at something like manufacturing output, which isn't affected by uh, measurement of public sector output. You can see that, sorry, in this case, the uh, UK is the blue line. We can see the UK has done better than France, Germany, uh, Italy over the whole period. If you take the later, latest period since we joined the single market, beginning of 21, then there's some convergence um, back. But whether that's of any significance or due to Brexit, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but overall, if we take the whole period from the referendum right the way through, Manufacturing output uh, in the UK has outperformed the, uh, the other countries. Now, it seems to me that, having seen this evidence, that that ought to be enough, really. The UK is clearly doing OK. Um, we'd say that not much evidence that Brexit has helped the UK, but very little evidence that it's hindered it either. Um, but quite a few commentators are not willing to let it go at that. So it's been quite, uh, quite uh, common and uh, well publicised to, to have counterfactuals instead, uh, arguments that the UK, which usually produce the conclusion that the UK was doing better before Brexit than most other countries and would have continued to do so. And the fact that it hasn't, therefore, suggests that even though the UK is doing OK, uh, it, it, it could have done better, and the effect of Brexit is therefore negative. The most 
widely publicised of these, I think, is the, um, uh, the counterfactual exercise uh, undertaken by the Centre for, uh, Center for European Reform, CER, uh, in what's usually called their doppelganger uh, analysis. And what they did for GDP was to have a, an index which was a weighted average of 22 other countries. It's the dotted line here. So it's quite similar to the UK before the referendum, which is marked by the vertical line there, weight, Australia, New Zealand, Greece is in there, Iceland, Ireland. But one of the first things, well, two things to say here. Uh, first is it's tuned up up to 2016 on a period of recovery in the UK from the uh, recession uh, connected with the banking crisis. But the more important thing to say, I think, is that there isn't much between individual members of this index uh, and the UK. So the UK is blue here, and the other two are Australia and New Zealand. So they're clearly growing faster than the UK. They grew faster before the uh, referendum, and they've continued to grow faster. So not terribly obvious why you would want to have them in an index. Even worse is somewhere like Greece, so you can see Greece was in a real mess real, bef um, up until just before 2016. Uh, the UK was growing, but uh, um, the Greek economy declined by about 25%. Um, but the decline did stop. At least it was, there was very little growth after 2016, but at least it wasn't declining. But that change from decline to growth um, helps to bump up the... Uh, uh, the, the, the doppelganger index. But here's the key thing. The doppelganger index is almost the same as the US. So you could just say, let, let's filling in little gaps here, but contributing very little in, in, in aggregate. So, so look, our, uh, uh, our conclusion um, is, is that this is really a statistical artefact. Um, the index includes places like Iceland, which has only got two, in, two exports uh, to, to talk about, uh, hardly a comparator for the UK. also includes Ireland, where the GDP figures are um, close to meaningless because of its tax haven status, uh, what Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, calls leprechaun economics. Can I just get a drink of water there? So we view this as a statistical artefact, and other than the US, it, it hasn't got much meaning. And it's fairly obvious why the UK, Germany, Japan, and other countries fell behind, uh, fell behind the US after 2016, essentially after Trump uh, became president. So let's move on quickly now from uh, GDP to investment. And perhaps the most common, and uh, we would claim misleading claim, is that Brexit has reduced business investment, thereby reducing growth. Uh, uh, and in the calculations of um, Jonathan Haskell of the Bank of England, cost each family in the UK a thousand pounds. This is achieved by uh, putting a trend through a cyclical upturn. Uh, again, the post-banking. Uh, collapse cyclical upturn in uh, in uh, business investment. This graph, by the way, is, is one of the most common you'll see anywhere. It's appeared several times in the Financial Times. It's appeared twice on, on a Newsnight programme two weeks ago, just in case you didn't get the point first time, they thought they'd uh, uh, show it again. So the idea is you, you have a trend here. You, you assume this trend goes on essentially forever, uh, and, and the UK is... Uh, has uh, underperformed. Just as a point of order, Graham, I mean, since Jonathan's not here to defend himself, I mean, I've got his paper here, and his trend line starts in 1998. He doesn't do it from 2006. So, I, I, I you know, okay. I'm just okay. making a point of order here, but that's not what Jonathan did. Uh -huh. I just think it's yeah. fair on him to... And on, and on this issue, fatwas about not going over time. So I, I hope, hope that could be, I hope that could be added onto my time. But uh, yeah, but please do make points like that. Fair enough. Um, 
If you fit a longer term trend from 1997 through to 2016, it's that. Uh, and the importance of this is that by 2016, by the time of the referendum, then uh, business investment would have been well above trend. And you can reasonably argue that it was then due for a cyclical downturn. Indeed, when I fit equations to this, it does predict a downturn uh, after 2016. Uh, UK in blue there, Germany in brown. You can see from 19, go from 1997, 1997, right the way through, business investment not that different from Germany. Uh, and the UK finishes up a little bit above Germany. It's below France. France was faster growing business investment before the referendum and continued to be faster uh, afterwards. Now here's uh, Jonathan Haskell's uh, chart. Seems to me it's fair enough to show it whether he's here or not. Um, and what Jonathan did was to fit a trend between two points, one in 1997 and the other one uh, second quarter of 2016. And the importance of that is that if you, if you fit that trend, then 2016 has to be on the trend because that's how you fitted it. Uh, and therefore you can't argue or you don't know uh, whether that point is above or beyond trend and what was likely to happen. Uh, Jonathan then just increases it 2%. He then allows for the pandemic, but he adds on 2% per annum all the time. Uh, one other point to notice here is he was using out-of-date data uh, and the revised data from ONS is about 10% higher uh, at the end than, uh, than his data. And finally, on investment, let's look at uh, foreign direct investment into the UK. This is in uh, millions of dollars, UN data. And uh, UK is the top line in blue. Very little sign there that Brexit uh, has uh, affected anything very much. And if foreign investors aren't too concerned about Brexit, I mean, they're the people we... This is where, where I might expect it to show up, where... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Where if people, were, if investors were worried about Brexit, we, we'd uh, uh, we'd perhaps expect that line to come down. Uh, some people have pointed out that the gap with Germany has narrowed, but the gap between France and Italy and the UK hasn't narrowed. Seems to me again, UK doing doing okay. And finally, in my section, let's come on to trade. Uh, this is UK export volumes, excluding oil and erratics. And here we see um, the blue line is UK exports to the, of goods to the EU. And it's recovered the previous uh, level. But actually, I think this is quite significant. It's done better than UK exports to non-EU countries. There have been all sorts of things going on here. There have been sh supply shortages, shortages of chips, for instance, from the Far East, which have affected car exports uh, to both uh, Europe and, uh, uh, and elsewhere. But if uh, UK exports have been doing better to the EU than to other countries, again, it doesn't really suggest that Brexit has had a, uh, a big effect. Some people have tried to say, ah, well, difficulty of getting imports from Europe has affected... Uh, exports to anywhere else, but really, I, I don't think that doesn't seem to be much evidence for that, and it, 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 it doesn't seem a very logical argument. Uh, this was just to show the turbulence around 2021. There was some stock building uh, just just before we uh, entered the or left the single market, uh, and then a big downturn, particularly in in January. Um, and it's taken a while, you know, taken something like 18 months to, to recover, but it does look as if we've recovered. There is evidence, I think, that small companies have found the additional paperwork onerous and stopped exporting to Europe. Um, but that effect doesn't seem to be large enough to, uh, to really affect the, the total or the aggregate. Um, what should, should we have expected? Goods, uh, UK goods exports to the EU tend to follow manufacturing output 
in the uh, uh, in the eurozone, which is the uh, the, the blue line. And certainly since the since we left the single market, quite a bit of turbulence there. But by the end, we seem to have got back to uh, to that long-term trend. So again, I think no no great impact there, and pretty well ditto for service exports. So conclusions. Uh, three conclusions here. Firstly, no real evidence of substantial negative impact uh, uh, on the UK economy due to Brexit, despite what you might read in the paper or hear on the BBC almost any day of the week. Attempts to use counterfactuals, uh, in our view, are just grossly misleading. Uh, and I think we really would argue for that uh, uh, people should stop doing that sort of work. It, uh, it, it's, um, it, it's leading to a wrong conclusion. And finally, uh, I think the continued focus on Brexit and mention of Brexit as a, uh, as a negative impact, uh, we feel is undermining true understanding of the UK's economic difficulties. UK has real economic difficulties, and these really started at the banking crisis, the, the lack of growth in productivity or the lack of sign of any pickup in productivity since is a real problem. It affects public expenditure, affects everything like all the holes in the road. I don't know what it's like in London. In Cambridge, you take your life in your hands dri driving anywhere. It's a real, so the, the slow growth of the UK economy is a real problem. But in our view, it's not due to Brexit. Uh, and if, uh, if p people would stop saying so, uh, then we could start to concentrate, I think, on what the real factors are. With that, I'll finish. Thank you. Um, thank you. Do I actually need the hand mic? Or is the... No, I didn't think so. Great, good. Okay. Um... Oh, what's that? Right, some bonus charts that I'm going to ignore. Right, okay. Um, well, Graham's talked primarily about the impact on GDP, investment and trade. Um, I'm going to focus on the impact of Brexit on sterling and on inflation and then wrap up with a few general remarks about um, uh, what we think the overall impact may have been. Um, I thought actually, funny if I, I would start with a counterfactual just to show that they have value in both sides of the debate. Um, you will often have heard it said that you know, Brexit uh, led to a collapse in the value of the pound in 2016 in the wake of the, the referendum vote. Um, so what this chart does is it shows a, an index for the value of sterling against a basket of other major currencies uh, weighted according to their importance in, in UK trade. Um, and you see I've marked the period um, in the years before and the years after the, the vote to, to leave the EU. Now, I, I hope you can sort of get two takeaways from this straight away. One is that the the fall in, in 2016, which actually, by the way, began in, in 2015, actually did little more than reverse the increase in the value of sterling between 2013 and about 2015. Um, and also, in the bigger scheme of things, it, it's nothing remarkable. If you look at this chart too, it's not as if sterling had been a sort of a safe haven currency, rock solid for, for decades. In fact, it had been in long-term decline for about 50 years. If I move on to you know, a possible alternative explanation for why sterling fell, um, I'm not, of course, saying that the result of the referendum didn't have any impact on the, on the timing or the extent of the fall in, in 2016. I mean, clearly, sterling tanked the day after the, uh, the vote came through. Um, instead, my counterfactual is that it probably would have fallen anyway, to some degree, perhaps over a longer time horizon. And to illustrate that, this chart shows what's happened to the UK's current account balance over this period. And that, that basically is the sum of trade in goods and services and various <coughs> investment flows, like the money that we're earning on income, on interest, or paying in interest, and, and dividends, and so on. Um, and you can see, again, I think two key points on this. One is that you know, there had been a very large deficit accumulating ahead of about 2015. So before the referendum, the UK's current account deficit hit about 7% of GDP or national income. That's a, that's a really big number. And it would suggest that you know, sterling at that point was significantly overvalued and, and due for a fall. Uh, and the second point, indeed, lots of people were saying that at the time, including people like the IMF, arguing that sterling was probably one of the most overvalued of the major currencies. 
So if it hadn't been Brexit that triggered the fall, it may well have been something else. Um, our next chart is inflation, specifically food prices. Um, now, what I've done here, I've shown the level of food prices because I sometimes think it's easier to see what's going on over a long period rather than looking at the annual inflation rates, but the, um, the story is pretty similar. Um, as it happens, this chart doesn't include the, n the numbers that came out earlier today. Um, I did waste about four hours of my life going through those numbers, and if you want to go on my Twitter feed, there's a detailed explanation of the breakdown of what caused the, the jump in inflation. Um, the key point, though, is they don't actually change the, the big picture. Interestingly, food prices rose more in the European Union in February than they did in the, in the UK, despite the shortages of tomatoes and strawberries and, and so on and so on. Um, so my main takeaway instead from this chart is basically the food prices have risen over the last few years by actually slightly less than in the European Union, uh, but it's not significantly different. Now, you may well be aware of some... You know, academic work suggesting that Brexit might have added 6%, for example, to food prices between 2020 and, and 2022. Um, my, my issue with that is that how do you square that with, with this data suggesting that food price inflation has actually been lower? I think you need to look for maybe alternative explanations for why food price inflation would be lower, or, in my view, suggest that your model actually isn't very good. Um, Turning to, to core inflation, so this is a measure of inflation excluding food and energy. Um, Adam Posen, in particular, has been keen to draw attention to charts like this that do seem to suggest that UK core inflation has picked up further than in the European Union um, since the vote to, to leave the EU. Um, and the logic of doing that is to say that, well, food and energy price shocks were, were common, but what's happening to core inflation is more of a specific UK problem. Um, now, to be fair to Adam, he, he was, I'm afraid, widely misquoted. He was, he was quoted by um, at least one newswire as saying that 80% of the UK's inflation problem was due to Brexit. That wasn't quite what he was saying. What he was saying is 80% of the UK's problem in the sense of why our inflation is higher than other countries. So the difference between the two is due to inflation. However, his version of this chart um, only actually started, if I remember right, in, in 2016. So it only showed the period since the, the referendum. Um, I would draw attention to the fact that UK core inflation has almost always been higher than Eurozone core inflation and typically tends to follow that in, in the US for whatever reason. Um, Adam Posen also suggested that if it's not Brexit, what else? Um, I can think actually of, of two reasons. Um, one is energy prices. Now, I know energy prices are excluded from the excluding food and energy measure of inflation, but that only strips out the direct effect. It doesn't pick out, no, strip out the indirect effect of higher energy prices on the cost of doing anything else in the country, including you know, running a restaurant or a shop and so on, all of which are in core inflation. Um, and the second point is the, the policy responses, I mean, particularly during the, the COVID pandemic and even more so in the energy crisis. Um, governments in, in Europe tended to focus on things that reduced measured prices, so for example, cutting VAT. Whereas in the UK, we focused on subsidising incomes, um, which supported real incomes, but didn't affect measured inflation in the same way. Um, next slide is a, a general slide about in this case, comparing the, the UK and Germany. Um, Adam Posen at least got the, the data right. Um, I'm going to have a very quick go here at Mark Carney, who um, produced a very bizarre claim that the UK had shrunk from more than 90% of the size of Germany's economy to, to 70%. Um, that was what we economists call a bit naughty, because he was essentially using market exchange rates rather than purchasing power exchange rates. And I'm pleased that uh, one of the other panel members today, Jonathan Porters, um, also debunked that claim. Um, if instead you simply look at what's happened to the level of, of, of real GDP in the two countries over the last decade or so, again, it, it, it's pretty similar. Our, our growth in particular since 2016 has been actually marginally better than Germany's, but again, not, not significantly different. Um, the UK did underperform during the pandemic. Um, I suspect partly explained by the better measurement of our GDP, as, as Graham mentioned. I think, by the way, that factor is still dragging on the official measure of GDP. It's quite striking how 
the latest monthly GDP numbers, the earnest statisticians have gone out of their way to measure how many people were actually going to school, how many children were being educated. So actually looking at the measuring the output of public services rather than simply looking at whether or not teachers are being paid and then concluding that output hasn't changed. So there's a continued measurement problem in there. Um, a few other quick, quick German lessons. Um, I, I need to update this first point because food price inflation in Germany is, is now something like 21, 22%. We found out this morning that it leapt to 18% in the UK. But the key point is food price inflation is, is higher in Germany than it is in the, in the UK. Um, real wages, um, also really interesting. They, they've fallen by more in Germany over the last three years than they have in the UK. Um, if I was going to push my luck, and in particular if, if Jonathan Portis weren't standing in front of me, I would claim this as a Brexit benefit because it would suggest that you know, labour shortages are actually boosting the wages of, of British workers in sectors like road transport uh, and health and social care. But that leads me to my, my third point, is the extent to which Brexit has caused a sustained loss of EU workers. And it, it's clearly true that you know, a lot of EU workers have, have left or not as many have come here. Uh, since the referendum, uh, and particularly post the pandemic. Um, but if you look at other countries, they have suffered something similar, not necessarily to the same degree, but Germany also saw a big exodus of EU workers during the pandemic, um, and, and many of them have not come back. So I think it's important to compare what's happened in the UK, not just to its own history, but also to what's been happening in, in other countries. Um, so finally, just briefly, some conclusions from, from all of this. Um, I... I think there is a lot of value in, in, in counterfactuals, and I, I could actually, if you like, criticise my own side for, for not using them more often. So, for example, I often see Brexiteers saying, look, UK unemployment is a lot lower than unemployment in the EU. That's clearly a success of Brexit, whereas, of course, in practice, UK unemployment has always been lower than that in the UK. Um, but I'm still not a fan of, of, of doppelgangers. I, I appreciate what uh, John and others are, are trying to do. But I'm just sceptical of the idea that you could take you know, a group of countries that have performed similarly to the UK over a, you know, a previous period under one set of circumstances and use that as a reliable benchmark for a different period in a very different set of circumstances. Um, I think sometimes Jonathan, John, sorry, um, tends to assume away the impact of COVID and the energy crisis. I think there are good reasons why COVID and the energy crisis might have hit countries in the doppelganger group very differently from those in the UK, including particularly countries like Australia and Canada that are major commodity producers. So, of course, they weren't hit as hard by an energy crisis as the UK was. Um, I'm also aware of what I call here the, the sins of aggregation. A particular you know, hobby horse of mine is when people compare GDP in, um, say, the European Union with that in in the UK, not taking account of the fact the European Union, of course, includes a lot of poorer countries that you might expect to be growing relatively quickly. Uh, and the, even the Euro area includes Ireland, where the numbers, of course, are crap. So I think it makes sense to, to compare the UK with individual countries, which is what we tend to do rather than the aggregate. Um, naive extrapolation of short-term trends, I, I think that's a, a criticism particularly of the, some, of the, some of the work that people have done on looking at what's happening to business investment. I mean, my sort of two general concerns, and, and again, I think it would be fair to criticise both sides of the debate for this from time to time. One is sort of too much tunnel vision or, or confirmation bias. So you, you have a theory that, um, that Brexit has crashed UK trade. So you look at the data and look for evidence that trade has fallen, and then you attribute that to, um, to Brexit without necessarily thinking of alternative explanations or looking at other countries and seeing if something similar has happened there. And then finally, what I call failing a, a, a basic smell test. You know, how, how plausible do you think your numbers are? Um, I think if the doppelganger model had suggested that you know, GDP is, say, 1% or 2% lower than otherwise, I would have thought, yeah, plausible. Yeah, I, I, could, I could run with that. But when it says 5.5%, then I think that just doesn't, doesn't smell right. And I'd want to look deeper into what the analysis behind that is. But that's more than enough for me. Shall I move on? Okay, well, um, thanks very much for having me. Um, uh, Anand and Mehreen very kindly said that I can have just five minutes to respond <laughs> to some of the criticism of my work, um, which, is, which is good to them. So, um, 
First thing is <coughs> counterfactuals obviously can't possibly be perfectly correct. We can't go and visit the universe in which we remained in the U European Union, measure the GDP of the UK, and then come back and tell everybody what happened. Um, so, but there are better and worse counterfactuals, right? Um, the first point to make is that individual countries, which Julian says we should look at, can't possibly be good counterfactuals. They have different economies, they have different policies, um, and Julian pointed out that Greece had a, had a massive depression, that's absolutely right, um, but that's why it only makes up a very tiny proportion of the doppelganger that I put together. Um, you, they're also right that the US is a bad comparator because of the fiscal expansion that went on, completely agree. Um, and in their paper, which Julian and Graham put together for briefings for Britain, which I think some of you may, may have had, um, they say, right, well, what we should do is just compare to France and Germany uh, as individual countries, because they're in Europe and they're kind of medium-sized economies in a global context. Um, and hey, presto, if you compare to France and Germany, you don't see much of an effect. Um, but if we look at France and Germany over the long run, um, we can see that this is a real problem. They're not very good comparators. So this is, this is the, so faster growth. This is basically GDP um, indexed to the second quarter of 2016, here, the referendum. Um, the more diagonal the lines are, the faster the growth is, and the flatter, the less fast the growth is. You can see the UK here, which is the black line, goes along like this. France and Germany, France is the blue one, flatter. Germany, also flatter. So there are some structural growth rate differences here which make France and Germany a bad comparator. They're right about the US, right? So if we look at, not necessarily the, the, you know, exactly what happens, but we see that in this growth phase, the gap between the UK and the US is similar. The lines are fairly parallel. Um, and in this phase, they are too. But as they say, quite rightly, when Trump gets in, he cuts taxes. And then we have a big COVID fiscal stimulus, much bigger than our own, and so their growth is better. So I'm like, let's just not use individual country, countries because they don't really, they can't possibly offer us a very good counterfactual. What's the next best thing you could do? Well, you can look at the UK within a range of advanced economies. Um, and this is what we do here. So if we take the 22 most advanced economies, and Julian, it wasn't that uh, um, I've included loads of poor countries here. These are the 22 most advanced economies that the, I, that the IMF um, designated as advanced in 1995. So it doesn't include places like Korea or places like that, right? And the reason for that is because they grow pretty quickly. Emerging and middle income economies have tended to grow more quickly than the UK has. So we've got a massive range. It looks pretty crazy. This is Greece. Julian is quite right that see a massive amount of growth between 1999 and the crash, and then it stagnates. This is the US and uh, Australia, uh, Canada, Luxembourg. They tend to have a faster growth rate than us. But if we look at the UK, then we can see we're sort of on the bottom half of the pack. And bottom half of the pack here means faster growing. Um, and that's true all the way up to the referendum. And then we start to become a bit middle of the pack. Um, you know, and then our growth starts to slow. And then by the end, you know, we're doing much worse than, or doing in the bottom half in terms of growth performance um, after COVID. So that's, you know, that, this tells us, OK, we've got some evidence here that within the range of 22 advanced economies, the UK was pretty good. We get to the referendum, it gets worse, and then it gets worse still. In terms of what the, the doppelganger actually does, it tries to take this logic further, right? So the idea is, let's look at this growth phase here between the, the recession, the end of the recession in 2009 and the referendum. Um, let's try and find from these 22 most advanced economies, the combination of those economies the, whose performance is most similar to that of the UK. And that's not just on growth, that's on all sorts of other variables like inflation, uh, how, how big their trade, their trade sectors are as a proportion of GDP, whether they have really big industrial sectors, how well educated their workforce is. Um, so we're trying to gather as much information as we possibly can from these 22 advanced economies to try and find 
the combination of them that most closely tracks the UK's performance and also the UK's economic structure. Um, and this is the Doppelganger line here. Um, and we can see that it tr closely tracks the UK up to the point of the referendum. And then it starts to diverge and it ends up being quite a lot higher. Um, final point I want to make um, is just in terms of doing a check on that. So if we, if we, sorry, if we go back to this slide very briefly, I know we're running out of time. Um, we can see that uh, um, the UK, we can measure what, where the UK was in this ranking, right? It's possible to measure, okay, so here, you know, it's about the 75th percentile all the way up to 2009. It stays around that percentile in terms of growth performance. Um, after, it drops right back, so it becomes much worse. So we can use that to measure, to do a, a check to see whether the doppelganger makes much sense by saying, OK, well, let's just carry on the 75th percentile and see what happens. Um, and we can see that in this chart here. So here's the UK. That's what actually happened. Here's the doppelganger. Um, and then this green line is the percentile that UK was in up until 2016. It was about the 75th percentile. And if we just continue that 75th percentile forward, then we see that it matches the doppelganger pretty closely. So by having a check on the, on the, on the doppelganger using a different method, we end up with something which looks pretty similar. Um, so that's it. That's all I wanted to say. That's my defense of my method. Um, and let's finally get on with the discussion. <laughs>
you'd be quite wrong to take that away. Um, the UK has done quite badly. And, and, and to be fair, Graham did, did bring that up in his conclusion that you know the UK's long-standard, very weak performance, economic performance, is of concern. And whether you think that's because of Brexit or whether you think it's because it had a very kind of um, extended period of weak productivity performance. Um, so, sorry, to go back to trade, um, there's two things that you would have expected to see, and these kind of get brought up most of the time. So, first of all, is underperformance of the UK compared to two comparators, and that's what we've heard quite a lot about already. So, the UK should be performing um, worse than the countries that look like the UK. Um, the second thing is um, the, what got brought up when we did briefly look at trade earlier um, on the screen is that you would expect the UK's trading relationship with the EU to fall relative to its trading relationship with non-EU. Um, and that's because you've, you've introduced the barriers just on EU trade and not on e, non-EU trade. So when we think about are these materialising and is the evidence there for those materialising, you most people were kind of expecting to see, uh, the consensus, sorry, was that we were expecting to see both of those impacts materialising. Um, and so to come to your, to your kind of question, which was, you know, the OBR and the Bank of England are still saying that these impacts are kind of on track and that they're happening, um, I think, what, what they're particularly looking at is, um, uh, or, or what they have kind of looked at is whether there is a difference between the, the EU um, and the non-EU trade share. Um, uh, and what I'll talk about now is what's happening to kind of the UK's underperformance compared to kind of other countries. So the analysis that we did, they just took a bit of a stock take. We're kind of two years post Brexit in terms of the amount of data that we have, um, or at least two years into the new trading arrangement. So trade with the EU under the trade and cooperation agreement terms. Um, and what we saw in 2021, so the first year, was this really big deterioration in trade openness. Um, and, you know, depending on the data that you look at, it looks like it's kind of improved a little bit in 2022. Um, it's important to say a lot of that is because of these, uh, the precious metal trade, which is, is you should just exclude and, and was excluded in, in the charts that were shown earlier that it, under the kind of erratics um, uh, category. Um, and, when, and when you kind of strip that out, goods export growth does look pretty much the weakest in the G7. Um, imports of both goods and services also look the weakest in the G7. So these do kind of align with that G, uh, the consensus expectation that the UK would be underperforming countries that look similar to it. Um, but I do want to say that there are two puzzles in the trade data that maybe like don't quite fit with, with what um, you would expect from, from kind of the trade models and, and the, the, the consensus view on, on the way that Brexit should be impacting, impacting trade. Um, and the first one is services exports. Um, and, and I will come back to the data issues before anyone um, gets, uh, get, gets too kind of nervous on that. But services exports do look like they are doing, um, are, are much more resilient than the rest of UK trade. Um, uh, so yes, there has been some sort of sectoral composition benefits. So the sectors that the UK specializes in are performing um, a bit better post COVID and kind of through the COVID um, recovery than the ones that maybe it, it specializes less in. So like if we think about certain types of travel where, but where the UK does a little bit less of, of that exporting compared to the professional services sectors. But even when you account for this kind of tailwind, the UK still looks like it's outperforming a typical OECD country. Um, so like even when you account for its kind of sectoral makeup, uh, that is you know somewhat kind of unexpected when you think about you know what you might have expected to see um, happening to UK services exports in the absence of access to the single market um, in, in its kind of nearest um, large services trading partner. The second one is this this question about the EU intensity of UK trade. So how much of our trade is with the EU versus non-EU? As I said, you would have expected to see because there were barriers put up with the EU, you'd expect to see. The EU share falling. Um, again, this hasn't materialised, and, and as was kind of shown earlier um, for, for UK exports um, and, and even for imports, where it did happen um, a bit more strongly, it, it sort of has been improving in recent improving. It has been returning to past trends um, in some of the more recent data. Um, so one argument, that's a couple of the arguments kind of already brought up. So one argument is that um, this means that Brexit hasn't really had a big impact on trade. Um, I guess my question on that is, if that was the case, then why is the UK underperforming you know, its G7 comparators overall? So UK exports do seem to be below where you'd expect them to be, even if they're not, the relative decline 
in EU versus non-EU trade um, doesn't necessarily match up to that. I think the other argument is, well, you know, which was also brought up earlier, was that it's because of these complex supply chains, um, you know, the EU, the UK imports something from France and then uses that as an input into what it exports to the US. And because of all the difficulties in getting it, it makes it harder to export to the US. Um, if that was the case, then you can also look at just the UK's imports of final goods, so not goods that are being used in supply chains, so like the apples that you'd buy in the supermarkets. And if you look at that, there's no reason why those should be affected by these like complex supply chain arguments. Um, you should see you know, the imports of apples. It should be now relatively easier to import apples from the US than it is to France, not in absolute terms, but in relative terms. Um, and so you should expect to see it there. And again, you don't. So I don't think either of these arguments really perfectly answer that question. Um, and, and probably both are kind of puzzles that sort of remain a bit outstanding and, and, and do need a bit more um, focus on. Um, as I said, I was going to return to this one final point, which is the, the, the data issues, um, which are abundant. and. You know, I, I think the services kind of question is, is incredibly important. The UK is a massive services exporter, and it often gets very, very overlooked because people know the data, data is not very good quality. Um, but we are a massive services economy, and, and kind of ignoring that and just focusing on goods exports is really missing a major part of what is happening in UK's uh, trade performance. So it is really important that we look at it. Um, but there are substantial and complex data issues, um, not just on the services side, also on the goods side. So on the services side, we have a, um, that the ONS has been doing something called um, GDP balancing adjustments. I mean, these always take place, but in the last year, um, these amounted to almost 12 billion pounds, um, uh, an almost 12 billion pound adjustment to UK's um, services exports, um, and to give you kind of a bit of scale of, of, of how much that is, that really moves the UK from the very, very top of the pack, which I was looking at, the kind of G7 pack, where the UK looks like it's the best services export performer to, to, to sort of very average um, in the middle. Um, and on the good side, we also have a, a huge number of uh, data issues. So we have um, the fact that the measurement, measurement changes um, on EU trade from, from um, uh, interest at survey measurement um, to, to customs. Um, and the ONS has given some kind of indication of, of the scale of those impacts, so we can correct for those, and we, and we usually do um, when we're looking at, you know, how is the UK kind of performing, but it does inflate um, the UK's EU trade, relative EU kind of trade performance post post Brexit. Um, and the second thing is that there was also some double counting due to delayed customs declarations. Um, and there we have a much less accurate estimate of what the kind of scale of that impact might be, um, although it was just limited to a kind of six month period. So we can kind of, you know, work around it. Um, but it might be that these data issues are a major component of the explanation for the two kind of trade puzzles that I set out earlier. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think they, they are the kind of questions that we should be asking about um, are we seeing everything that, that we kind of expected to see um, in overall? I think that's it. Is Thank that you, Sophie. Um, Jonathan, Julian mentioned migration a little bit. It hasn't actually come up in that much so far, but if we think about a lot of the reporting we do and a lot yeah. of the things we hear in the news, labour shortages and the, the ability of non-EU workers who are coming into the UK to not actually fill the jobs that were left by those EU workers who either left for Brexit or the pandemic has become quite a, uh, an important political issue. So maybe you could spend a couple of minutes just talking about uh, free movement and, and some of the migration elements of this Brexit debate. I will do that. Um, let me start there with sort of a representative of the, the home team, UKIS, to try and sort of say, sort of step back a bit and say, you know, our job is to try and present a sort of uh, objective view of, of social scientists or to, synth you know, to synthesize and bring together what, you know, and, and you know, in some sense, I don't have a big dog in this fight. As Maureen says, I'm an immigration economist far more than a trade economist. Um, and, and what does this look like to me? Um, I mean, first of all, I think uh, the uh, hearing both, both um, um, Graham, Julian, and, and John's presentation. Um, I have some considerable sympathy for their criticisms of some of the ways that the, the, counter, the doppelganger, or what we call a synthetic counterfactual model, um, operates in this space. And it does seem to me that actually, Julian's final point, does this quite pass the smell test, is a valid one. I don't personally believe that the impact so far has been as high as 5%. 
On the other hand, um, I think, you know, the synthetic counterfactual method is, I think, economists would agree, the standard approach in these circumstances is not to compare to some country that you choose to pick because it's large and nearby. And John is right about this. And the challenge, I think, for, for Graham and Julian to say, well, you know, if you're going to come up with a quantitative estimate, what methodology would you use to come up with a quantitative estimate? Because if you're going to say, well, you should look at Germany or France, then no one is going to take that seriously compared to John's method, which at least is regarded by economists as being the least bad method to adopt. Now, you can do it differently, you can criticize it, but there is some responsibility on people sort of sniping at John, and I include myself here, as I say, because I don't quite believe the 5% either, uh, to say what the alternative is. Um, and I think, um, moving on to what Sophie said about trade, as, as Sophie said, the UK's overall trade performance has been lousy. Um, and it's really a bit odd of Graham to show a, a, a chart showing that, well, trade is back. You know, having shown a bunch of charts comparing us with other countries, on, including France, Germany, and others, on trade, not to show uh, on GDP, not to show the same chart on trade, which shows our underperformance is lousy. Uh, it, yeah, our performance has been lousy. So um, I challenge here to, to Graham and Julian do they accept that by any measure, including the ones that they've adopted, UK trade performance has clearly been pretty rubbish? Um, and the most obvious explanation for that is, is, is Brexit. Um, because if you'd actually shown the same charts you've shown for GDP for trade, we know that's what it would have shown. So I think, um, where does all that leave me? Um, well, I'm going to ask everybody to, to say what their actual point estimate is for the impact of, GD, of Brexit on GDP so far. We know, John's it's 5.5%. As I say, I don't personally buy that. Um, I personally would go with something in the region of 2.5%, but that's not scientific. I don't have a model, so that's my instinct based on my assessment of the evidence, all the evidence we've seen and others. But I would actually like each of the other panelists to say, to actually give a simple number, you know, zero, plus two, or minus 5.5 <laughs> in John's case, um, but whatever they actually think their central estimate is. Um, moving on then, um, so, uh, um, I mean, I think my overall takeaway is that, you know, and I, I you know, sort of in the same, you know, we haven't seen anything, uh, you know, it is in the same camp as the Bank of England and the OBR is. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yes, Sophie is right. The data, especially on trade, is a mess. But overall, there's all sorts. Julian mentioned the data, which both of us have looked at, about why measuring the output of the public sector is different in different countries. That's a fair point. Um, uh, there's not a lot of reason. You know, it's hard to justify moving away from the OBR and the bank central estimates. We seem to, you know, what they say, well, what is the OBR and the bank saying? They're saying, well, we had a bunch of reputable econo economists doing reputable models pre-Brexit. They came up with this number. So far, it's sort of, there's no good reason for, that, for us not to assume we're broadly on track for that. And I just don't, nothing I've seen tonight has, has convinced me that there's any particular reason to change that very boring middle of the road view about, uh, about where we are. But on immigration, however, um, which isn't in the 4%, it's not in the uh, BOE, OBR 4%, there the facts have changed and I've changed my mind uh, um, on what's going to happen. You know, I and others, including the Home Office, um, thought that uh, the shift uh, would have uh, a Significant, not huge, but significant negative long-run impact on GDP uh, because we thought it would be lead to a significant reduction in overall migration levels. Um, and that would not be offset by increases from outside the EU, nor would it be offset from a shift towards more skilled migrants. Um, so far, at least, though, the policy has been quite different from what we thought would be the case in 2017. It's been considerably more liberal. Um, in, you know, both towards skilled workers and towards workers in the health and care sector. Um, and uh, I, like the OBR, have adjusted my views quite considerably. I don't see that negative impact anymore. And going more to sort of the, 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 the longer term, 
positive, I mean, John and I did some work, which some of you will have seen, saying that there is a shortfall so far. But I think already that is being at least part turned around. So while on the more, you know, what are the sort of sunlit uplands here, um, I, there clearly are some significant economic and adjustment costs which we are seeing now, as John and I set out, to the change to new migration system. But I think it's not unreasonable to suggest that most modeling of the same sort of modeling that gave us the negative trade impact from Brexit would suggest that a somewhat more liberal overall and somewhat more skill-oriented migration system would, in five or ten years, lead to UDK GDP and productivity being higher than otherwise would have been. Now, that, of course, assumes that politicians can actually uh, withstand pressures to, uh, to tighten the system again, uh, because unlike trade policy where we sort of know where we are, uh, migration policy is always uh, subject to these uh, political pressures. But if we stay on the course that we're on now, I'm relatively optimistic about the long-term impacts. And, and one might hope that over the long run that might offset some of the, the downsides uh, on the trade side. Enough Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I should also start with a correction, which is a terrible pla place to be. We started at 6.30. We didn't start at 6.30, we started at 7. So we're ending at 8.15, so it's an hour and 15 minutes. And for those of you who want to stay, uh, we'll be around afterwards for drinks so you can catch uh, the panel there. Very quickly, Graham, I heard you whispering, but do you have that number for Jonathan? <laughs> What's your number? <coughs> Julian, do you have yeah. the same to you? Can I say, it seems to me, um, this is slightly a criticism of my, my esteemed colleague of whom I've got a, a highest opinion, but, <laughs> but to start introducing sniff tests and 2.5% and is my view, you, you know, this is getting ridiculous. People like John <laughs> spent a long time try, try, trying, to, trying to get a number, and we can debate you know, whether it's a sensible number. Uh, I run a macroeconomic model. It takes me, well, my wife complains badly of the amount of time it takes. Um, we do this. It, it really isn't very helpful for people to start saying, you, you know, that, 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 Let's have a guess. But the, the, work, I ha the work I have done uh, in this marine is, does, does suggest that uh, Brexit has had negligible effect on UK, UK's growth uh, either way. If, it's had a, if exports have been growing slower than in other, say, European countries, and there are, as Sophie said, big um, uh, change, changes in the way things have been measured, so it's difficult. Um, but if that's the case, why hasn't that fed through to GDP? I mean, in real GDP, um, we, we're growing about the same rate as Germany as we, uh, as, as, as we always have. And I, I'm, I'm not sure about Sophie's point about it. She seems, seems to suggest we were doing a lot worse than Germany. It's, it's getting into Carney territory here, and jo jo Jonathan, Jonathan can uh, perhaps come back on, on, on that. But I mean, we both, both Julian and I showed the charts for GDP in uh, UK and Germany, real GDP, and, you know, and to the first approximation, they're the same. And then there's a big problem then, I think, for, for it, people. Sorry, that was coming back on my point. I was just making the distinction between uh, real GDP and real GDP per capita. Yeah. So per capita, you didn't show, and the UK does underperform Germany. Um, and I'm not saying that that's a Brexit thing. I'm saying there's a very long period of underperformance of the UK relative to Germany on a per capita basis. Um, sorry, sorry, I missed that. Fair enough. Since, since, since 2000, 2008. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. Before um, that, before that. It was since the yeah, since yeah. the financial crisis. Yeah. So, so it's not just Brexit. It's since financial crisis, yeah, but yeah. whether I, I, there's I, a Brexit bit in yeah. there as well, it's, it's just a different measure. It's real GDP yeah. per capita rather than, than GDP. So we've got lots of questions. I'm going to uh, group them together. One uh, one big theme is how to realise the benefits of, of Brexit uh, and, and, and what's the model and approach that the UK should, should take. So we've got a couple of questions from Paul Giles and John Peat, who's also here. Um, and they both sort of posit the, the notion that the only way, is the only way to realise the economic advantages of Brexit to become a, a low tax, relatively deregulatory uh, jurisdiction that can compete with the EU and sort of, you know, get rid of those shackles. Um, is that the only model? I think I would posit that we're seeing the UK's biggest neighbours sort of go headfirst into industrial policy, which seems to be the counter-opposite of that version of a, a low tax deregulatory environment. They want to spend lots of taxpayers' money pumping into, you know, state aid and, and green industries. So, Graham, Julian, do you have any thoughts about what should be the economic philosophy that can best 
realise these benefits? I'll just go first. Then. Please. Yes. Um, well, I'll, I'll go first. But first of all, I'll, I'll just quickly answer Jonathan's question. Um, from sort of economic first principles, economic 101, if you like, I think the initial economic impact of Brexit has to be negative because what you've done is you've increased trade barriers, you've reduced the freedom of <coughs> movement of, of labour, and you've increased business uncertainty in particular. So um, whatever my number is, it would initially be a negative. Um, my feeling is it would be nearer 1% nearer than, than 3%, but I think you have to acknowledge the initial impact of, of Brexit has been negative. However, I think that was always likely to be the case because you're, you're, you're shaking things up, you're doing the bad things first, you're not yet doing the, the good things that hopefully will yield long-term benefits. And also, the period of change is the one of maximum uncertainty before businesses have time to adjust. So I think the impact, the negative impact initially will, has been smaller than people say, and also is likely to be more transitory than, than many people assume. Brings me, though, to the, to the benefits. Um, I'll dismiss one straight away, which is the saving of whatever it is, 20 billion or whatever, on payments to the EU. Because if, if John and others are right, that's more than offset by the hit to the public finances from a weaker economy. So I dismiss that. Um, instead, you have to go down two other routes. One is the you know, better regulation of the economy. Uh, not necessarily deregulation. It's not necessarily a bonfire of, of regulations. It's just doing things better than the EU would have done. I could come up with a whole host of examples there and things like um, agricultural policy, biotech, financial services, and so on. Um, big caveat there, though, straight away, is that you know what we've just agreed with with the, the, the um, uh, agreement on the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I think does threaten to tie the UK very closely to single market rules for the foreseeable future. So that avenue is rather narrower than it was. Uh, and then the second route, of course, is the opportunity to, to um, lower trade barriers to the rest of the world, not necessarily with the EU, but the rest of the world, either through new free trade deals or, or unilaterally. And again, unfortunately, there's, there's a big caveat there is, you know, how willing is this government or any other government to seize those opportunities? We, we've seen the pushback against, for example, the, the Australian free trade deal. Um, the, the problem with free trade, as you know, is that overall it's a net positive for the economy. Um, but the costs are concentrated amongst a relatively small group of people who find it very easy to form lobby groups and push back. So all we see is the National Farmers Union saying this is a disaster rather than people speaking up for consumers for whom free trade is a, is a benefit. So I, I, am, I am nervous. I think Brexit has created these opportunities, but it's a fair question whether this government or any future one is actually going to take advantage of them. Graham? Uh, I agree very much with uh, Julian's last point there. I mean, whether we get any benefit from Brexit or not depends what UK governments do. Um, so far, they, they seem to have taken very little advantage of it at all. And it may be difficult to take much advantage. Um, partly because all these regulations that people complain about from Europe, I mean, the great majority of those are global regulations uh, coming in. That, you know, no, nobody wants their sofa to catch fire. No, nobody, no, nobody wants their toddlers to lick lead paint off toys, you know, <laughs> et, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So there's probably not all that much uh, scope, in, in my view, for, for gaining through uh, regulation. Um, so I, d I don't know whether we'll get much benefit uh, from, from this, we certainly have to strike out in a very different direction if uh, if we are to get m much benefit. But can I say I, I didn't vote for Brexit because I thought it was going to be uh, economically wonderful. Uh, I, I agreed with Lord David Frost. I, I I voted for Brexit in order to take part in meaningful elections. Um, and meaningful elections can can lead you to better policies and or or, or, or not. But given the shambles we've had over the last few years, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're a long way from that. John, can I, can I also ask you about this point about um, the economic model? So there are some small areas where the UK has tried to diverge. Uh, financial services, one of them. We're now in a more volatile financial services environment and maybe trying to cleave out a more competitive city is not going to be in line with what we're actually seeing happening in the markets. But is there an opportunity for this sort of regulatory arbitrage that the UK can can make the most out of in green regulations around net zero? I mean, is there sort of some low-hanging fruit that maybe this government or the next one can, can look at as sensible and, and, and politically feasible? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there are, you know, reg regulation is just a fact of life. Um, regulation can be poorly designed. There are things that the EU got wrong, right? So there are going to be some benefits um, to, in some cases, if we get it right, to regulating some sectors better. 
Um, but there are, a few, there are a few reasons to think, I, I agree with Graham, that I don't think this is going to have much impact on overall performance. One is that the UK was a relatively lightly regulated economy as part of the EU. If you look at all of the measurements of how uh, regulated the economy was, put together by the OECD, it was, it was much less regulated than the United States in some areas, particularly in product markets. Um, and it had a relatively lightly regulated labour market as well. Um, so, the, so the gains that you can get from pushing that back still further aren't going to be very big. There's definitely some advantages in agriculture because um, I agree with the, your criticisms of the common agricultural policy, Julian, um, and I would add genetically modified organisms. These are things which can potentially improve the productivity of agriculture, but it's a small, very small share of the UK economy, you know, one to two percent max. Um, and there are lots of things that we can do with biotech and data and all of that kind of stuff. But generally, you know, there have been various studies which have been done to try and assess, you know, what's the impact of deregulation on growth. Um, and the answer is not very much. Final point on um, finance, there's obviously a trade-off here, um, as we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, um, which was uh, tinkered with, the financial regulations which were intended to try and keep these banks safer were tinkered with by the Trump administration and Sil Silicon Valley Bank ended up being more lightly supervised and regulated than uh, it was before the Trump administration. Um, so yes, you can say, okay, we're going to try and reduce, reduce oversight here, we're trying to reduce regulation, but you create risks in other parts of the sector. And so you know, generally, whenever you talk to financial regulators, they say, we're not here to, you know, be, to be light touch. Um, we're here to try and see, seek competitive advantages where possible. But the first and most important thing is stability. Um, and I think that is going to serve, serve your growth prospects much better than a competitive race to the bottom. I thought it was also um, quite ironic to note that the Chancellor decided to impose a, a fiscal straitjacket on himself, which almost exactly mirrored mm -hmm. the EU's fiscal rules of keeping <laughs> the deficit below 3% yeah. and having debt declining. So maybe on that sense, uh, we're not yeah, going to see just too much so I, I think the tax question is a, is a red herring because there's nothing really to stop us from cutting most taxes in the Inside UK. The EU. Yeah, and yeah, Ireland I mean, is a... Is possible with the exception VAT would be the obvious one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm going to allow those of you who came to, the, to, to see us to have some privilege. So if anyone wants to put their hand up, we do have a mic uh, at the back. So we have one gentleman at the front and the lady in the blue just behind. So, uh, Did I miss anyone else's hand? Because we can group them together. Actually, we'll, we'll, that's it, sort of, yeah, we'll start and then we'll take two there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Keep them short and snappy. Yeah. Putting my own cards on the table, I voted Remain. But I think um, what will improve the, Brit the UK economy is if we um, brought forward at a fast scale um, infrastructure projects like Heathrow, expansion, HS2, and also bring forward at a fast pace North Sea oil gas expansion and the coal coal, which is a vital um, feedstock for our steel sector. And the, the two ladies just behind. And let us know who you are as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Kilgore. I write for The Conservative Woman. Um, my question is relating to the budget. Um, what are your thoughts on the 25% corporation tax rate now uh, as applied to the situation of independent contractors, people who work in tech, for instance, who will now have to pay higher taxes? What effect do you think that will have on the UK economy? Yeah, and just the lady, just the lady next. Hi, my name is Andrea B.C., fellow dual American-British. I um, wanted to ask John, were you attributing the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank to the policies from the Trump era? No, okay. Um, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, if, and if, if everyone's aware, if you're going to point fingers of people in administrations during financial collapses, um, Barack Obama's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, was a director at Freddie Mac during the collapse. And I have to say that was, I think Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were long standing. Sure, I, I mean, I don't think John yeah. was making a point yeah. about the, the okay. equivalence okay. between yeah. um, SVB. And actually, given that we, that was less of a question, we've just got a gentleman just behind Anand, yeah. And we'll take those three 
uh, Neil Ward, University of East Anglia. Uh, we've got a huge challenge with uh, net zero for the economy over the next 27 years, and I just wondered whether the panel thought that um, Brexit frees us up and um, gives us any greater prospect of being able to do a just net zero transition for the economy. So we have a question about having needing more investment, particularly in, in transport networks. What everyone thought about the planned increase to the headline, the, the, headri the headline rate of corporation tax, and then also about net zero. Who wants to have at it? Have a, a quick go. Yep. Um, I, I think the general point to make is that, in in a sense, none of those are really questions about Brexit, and they're very very <laughs> important questions in their in their own right. I can happily speak for ages about the UK's corporate tax regime, for example, and I think the, the increase in the corporation tax was a, was a big mistake, even though it was partially offset by the investment allowances. But that, that's not a Brexit issue. We could have done that, or we could have done you know, pretty much anything independently of, of, of Brexit. Um, on, the, on the opening question, though, about yeah. um, infrastructure investment more, yeah. more generally, again, I, I was struggling to think of a Brexit angle on this, but then I reflected that of, yeah. on two, actually. I mean, if pressures of Brexit led to more investments in infrastructure, that's what I mean. Yeah, but of course we could have done that anyway. But, but the, the two ways I thought it was a Brexit angle, one is a, a lot of that might be around the issue of state aid, yeah, and yeah. it might be... You know, many people on the on the left, if you like, the, the Lexit group who support Brexit because they think it's an opportunity for more state intervention in the economy, which is interesting because I supported it because I thought it was an opportunity for less state intervention in the economy, yeah, which yeah. shows that people voted for Brexit for, for very different reasons. So that might be one part of it, is that you can do more state subsidies if you wanted to, though I personally wouldn't. Um, the second point is around um, solvency too, so the, the, the financial sector making it easier, for example, for insurance yeah. funds to invest in longer-term infrastructure yeah, yeah. projects, which is something that um, the UK is you know, very keen to do. Um, there was a caveat there. I suspect the EU might well move in that direction in due course as, as yeah. well. So it might be that we get a head start on them, but we might mm. have ended up in the same position if we'd remained a member of the European Union. Just on net zero, we've also got some questions about industrial policy and green industrial policy and whether... The UK is supposed to be following the Inflation Reduction Act playbook, which you know, we know that Europeans are very upset. The UK is also not particularly happy, but it hasn't really said what it was to do. Uh, Graham, Jonathan, Sophie, what do you think about the this sort of burgeoning debate about uh, active in, uh, industrial policy and I mean, I can cover sort of why the idea that the UK can just kind of fight fire with fire maybe is, is not really going to work. So... The, the, the nature of the industrial policy with the, with the big subsidizations and the, and the policy which relies on um, uh, limiting uh, companies' ability to use imports in, in their supply chains is effectively like a large component of, of how the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act policy will work. Um, and the UK can't really just replicate that in the same way. And the reason is the size of the domestic market. So if you're the EU or if you're the US, you have a massive domestic market, which you or in the case of the EU, uh, effective massive, effectively a massive domestic market of, of the 27 countries um, that are members of the EU. Um, and so that gives enough weight and enough ability for, for the firms that are benefiting from that kind of additional protectionism to, um, to uh, get up to the scale that they need to, and then they can kind of export outside of there. And that's not really a possibility for the UK. Um, because we are much, much smaller markets um, and you need to have access to those EU and US markets, which you're not going to have because of the, um, because of the policies that they have um, in place or, or that they might put in place. Um, that's not to say that you can't have like a sensible industrial policy around net zero and around green issues, um, and, and you should. Um, you just shouldn't try and like compete on a kind of like-for-like -like basis, and the policies just shouldn't be just replicate, which um, and, and potentially was the question. Um, there's two things to also remember with those policies. Like one is like we shouldn't forget that for consumers, and actually you know these are global goods. These are kind of global goods with a. Um, positive externality, like actually having more subsidies and having more investment in some of these industries is 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 a good thing um, for the world, like not for UK producers who, who will um, potentially suffer from them. Um, uh, and it is the, the UK producers that are the real losers here. Um, and, and as I said, the second thing is that you just need to be a lot more targeted and a lot more intentional in your kind of industrial policy. So which are the areas in those kind of supply chains where um, those protections aren't already applying to um, uh, producers in the in the US or in the EU and, and where the UK has a comparative advantage or has some natural strengths in which it can 
um, you know, not need to rely just on its domestic market, but still kind of export um, the goods that it's producing. Um, but yeah, just as a kind of high level answer. Yeah, um, just building on that, um, Julian's right, of course, uh, um, and Graham implicitly was right, you know, that, that, you know, the point of Brexit is we can choose. We can have massive industrial policy or we can have total unilateral free trade. Um, but I think what's come out of this discussion is that the, um, the, 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 the IRA and other similar moves um, shifts the, uh, both the politics and the economics of that in a not necessarily favorable position for, 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 for the UK. Um, with a good, strong global trading regime under minimum standards, uh, controls on excessive subsidies, the rest of it, WTA fully functioning, um, we might have gone down it might have been more plausible to go down the sort of route that, that Julian's go down. Um, uh, equally, uh, um, but um, unfortunately, uh, that's much harder if the, that system isn't working, and it's not. Um, so that puts a premium on us having an industrial policy. But, the, but actually, the trade-offs of us having an industrial policy, as Sophie just said, are considerably more negative when we're on our own. Um, and that means that for an industrial policy to work, we're going to have to be really good at it, um, and history, um, you know, and maybe we can, you know, uh, yeah. uh, um, may, may, uh, you know that's what that's that's the Starmer Reeves uh, uh, prospectus for what it's worth. Um, uh, that somehow we'll suddenly be really good at doing industrial policy outside of either the EU and the, the, the UK. Um, call me cynical, but... Um, we, um, um, and just finally on the corporation tax, I'm, I'm not going to do a long thing about corporation tax, uh, where Julian knows from, but just on the small contractor's point, 25% only applies over above 250, so uh, uh, um, it's, uh, it's not as bad as you think. Smaller businesses pay a slightly lower rate of 19. Not up to 19, 19, up to 50, and then slightly yeah. going up. But anyone under 100,000 isn't going to have a big Will be yet. exempted, exactly. We have, we're running out of time, but I'm going to leave it to our last three speakers. I'm going to give you 30 seconds each to give some closing remarks. And also, if we're back here in a couple of years' time, given the fact that we will enter into general election year next year, probably towards the end of next year, is, are any of the things that we've spoken about today, the longer, medium runish trends that we've seen, do you expect anything to really change uh, in terms of Britain's economic landscape? So I'll give you 30 seconds each, Graham, <laughs> Julian, and John, and then we will wrap yeah, up. The, 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 the really big potential advantage of Brexit is reorienting our trade to faster growing parts of the world, particularly in the Far East. We're about to, we're about to announce membership of the Trans-Pacific Partnership which is rather oddly named, but it includes quite a lot of the, uh, the old Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're, we're getting back to them, and they're, they're, they're quite fast growing. Um, just a one quick point on corporation tax, which I've looked at a lot through studying the uh, Irish economy. Uh, it does tend to work. Uh, I mean, uh, managing directors don't get off planes and say, uh, you, you know, I'm here for the tax advantages. They always say, I'm, I'm here because of your wonderful workers and things. Etc. But actually, well, when you look at the record, they do, they do follow the tax advantages quite a bit. That doesn't necessarily mean that it pays for itself. So, so there are problems with somewhere like the UK. Clearly, it does pay for itself in, in, in Ireland. Um, but the, the, the really odd thing about Ireland is it doesn't seem to have increased the living standards. It doesn't actually get down to the, the, the population. There's a lot of money swilling through Ireland. I think the alternative measure that the Irish Statistics Office showed the economy is actually in recession. So um, we have to sort of discount a lot of the uh, slightly more... Um, yeah, the, the, in living standards, they're actually a poorer country than us. But if you look at GDP per head, the, 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 that says they're nearly double mm. UK standards. And, and if you believe that, you believe anything. Julian? Uh, well, just, just very briefly, if I focus on the sort of three negatives that I described from Brexit so far, I think there are good reasons for all of them, not necessarily turn into positives, but at least to diminish over time. One is the disruption to the freedom of movement, but as, as Jonathan says, we might end up with a regime that's just as good or potentially even better. Um, the second is the, the various new trade barriers with the European Union, particularly the non-tariff barriers, the red tape and so on. But over time, we'll get better at, at dealing with that. And then the third is the, the impact of uncertainty. And I, I think you know, it's perfectly plausible to believe that business investment is lower than it would otherwise have been because of that additional uncertainty. Um, but I think that will fade over time as well as people adjust to the new regime and we fix some of the problems in the existing system. Uh, and throughout this period, actually, the UK has, has remained at or near the top 
of lots of poles for attractiveness as a place to invest. Mm. Um, similarly, the, you know, the, the city of London seems to have you know, largely escaped unscathed from, from Brexit. So as this uncertainty clears, I think there is actually quite a lot of scope for you know, more investment back into the UK. But I think the scope for a massive increase is, is limited because as I, we've argued before, we don't think there was a big fall because of Brexit to begin with. Uh, in 30 seconds, what <laughs> Brexit has done has um, made the economy uh, more rigid and less able to cope with shocks. Um, so if you think about um, COVID, for example, uh, we, um, you know, we ended up with a, 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 a very steep recession and a, a, a big climb out of it. Um, we had a surplus of, de of demand over supply, which is why we've ended up in inflation. Um, one of the things that you can do to help with that is to import more labour. Um, free, not being in the free movement zone has made that more difficult. Um, oh. You can also, you can also in oh, half a million last year, John. No, no, I know, but most of those weren't for work, right? And so the work that Jonathan and I—I I don't know if you've seen it—but we mm. end up with quite a sizable shortfall up to up to 2022. Um, that, as Jonathan says, that might that might dissipate in time. Um, in terms of uh, the manufacturing sector, then we've imposed some sizable trade barriers on our on our manufacturing exports. Um, that is going to be quite difficult to surmount. It's not going to get any easier. The costs of getting over the border frictions are going to remain the same. Um, so we can just say that manufacturing output that we would have sent to the EU but is now uncompetitive because of those trade barriers, that's gone. Right? So, um, and then finally, there are some, some reasons for a bit of pessimism, I think. One is that the EU is moving towards industrial policy in ways which is inimical to our interests. For example, the carbon border adjustment mechanism means that some of our heavy industry is at least going to have to go through a lot more paperwork in order to be able to export their products to the European Union. Um, and we're in the middle of a subsidy race between the US and the EU, which is going to inflate the size of their manufacturing sectors. It's harder for us to do the same thing, largely because there's a real fear in the Treasury that those subsidies are going to be wasted because our manufacturing sector is less competitive. So I'm not saying that this is, abs you know, that this is total doom and gloom. We will start growing again. My point is just that we have to be honest that Brexit does mean that the economy is going to be smaller in the long run than it would have been. Um, my estimates are what they are, I stand by them, um, but I don't think that we can think, oh well, the, uh, the, the benefits of Brexit are going to come along down the line um, if we just try hard enough. These are, these are big uh, geopolitical issues, but they're also just about the technicalities of trade and the difficulties of getting over border frictions. So that's it. Thank you. On that note, John, um, yeah. for those who want, who want to stick around, I think we'll be, we'll be just outside. Uh, so my last task is to thank all the panellists. Thank you guys for coming and hopefully we'll see you soon.